You gotta love her. Truth seeker right there. Truth spitter right there, citizens. She'll put it all on the line for the truth. We've seen her do it. She'll sacrifice it all. Late night dinners can't happen no more when she, <laughs> when she throws it all on the line. All that traveling, all those little vacations, they can't happen no more when you throw it all on the line because they'll fire you for what you believe in or ask you to leave or force you to leave or make it where you want to leave. A whole institution to come after you, climb over your back and won't let you forget the truth that you spoke and then twist it and distort it and make it seem like it's something that ain't. But the strong, the strong will always survive. And they say the truth shall set you free. And the truth set this woman free. And you'll learn more about her truth when you read her memoir, Uphill. Oh, man, we've seen her. We've seen her revolutionize the way they talk and write about sports. Give her a round of applause for that. Woo! Right? We saw the National Association of Black Journalists name her Journalist of the Year. We saw that. Did we see that? The inaugural McKenzie Cup was awarded in honor of sports editor Van McKenzie at the annual Pointer Media Summit. She won that back in the day. We know that, right? <laughs> yeah. God did. She stood up against somebody sitting in the most powerful seat in the world and called that person out, called out a president. That's right. And he called her name back. She did that, right? Yep. And he spelled it correctly. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome her back. When you talk about culture, a lot of times you... You're misinformed. You're not even using it correctly. But when we affiliate culture with her, we're being 100% accurate. She is the culture. Give it up for the one and only Jamil Hill. Jamil! Jamil Hill! Jamil Hill. Damn, so you got me wanting to like run through a brick wall after hearing that intro. I was like, is he talking about me or somebody yeah. else? I'm hyped now. Right. Hey, Shit. I ain't go about 20 rounds with somebody. Let's go. I just have to say shit. <laughs> and it makes sense to me because sometimes, first time we ever hung out, I was just speaking about this. We 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 had we hung out at the White House, y'all. Mm. That's a flex. Nice. That's a serious flex. Yeah. That is that not is. a coffee shop. First time. And we, and we started communicating like we had known each other forever. And it was an excitable moment. So when I read in this book, that at one point your parents decided to move to my hometown mm -hmm. and raise you in the tutelage of the oh, environment boy. that has go. done nothing but build, nothing but just we go. change makers, you know, just leaders, you know, vanguards, trailblazers. The fact that she grew up in Oakland, California, it all makes sense to me. Jamil, you nice. could have left that part out. <laughs> Michigan, Detroit, baby. What yeah. up, though? What up, though? Uh, Sway put a lot on that. Um, a lot. He put a lot on that. I, I was conceived in Oakland. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but my, it is true, my parents. Uh, they moved out there. My mother moved out there uh, after, when she turned 18 to, to live with my father. And so, mm -hmm. yes, I have some roots in Oakland. Oakland and Detroit, we we are cousins, like first Kindred cousins. Kindred spirits. Kindred spirits. Like yeah. everybody I meet from Oakland, down to earth, you know, so much, so many relatable things that we have in common. I, I fuck with Oakland people hard. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. For I sure. get it. Yeah. What, Heather? Then how does this happen? Like, <laughs> Jamil Hill, Citizens of Sway in the Morning, walked in here with Mike Muse and they started set tripping and they from oh, the yeah. same yeah. state. Right. How could you be cousins with, with Sway in Oakland That's so true. and set trip with Mike Muse, exactly. who your real land because cousin? Because he, he went to that terrible <laughs> university. Michigan State, they don't have to pick a side, right? They flip flop. Constantly flip flopping. No. I know my side. You from Lansing, where Michigan State is. Okay, right. Michigan State is in East Lansing. Mike is from Lansing. Yeah. And the fact that he is a traitor is yeah. unbelievable. No. No. I just had to go with the best option, Jamil. Then you should have went to Michigan State. No, that's why I left. <laughs> you went to the second best option. No, that's why I Yo. left Jamil to go to number one. We're number four right now in the football that's standings. Y'all wow. have been ranked. Yeah. That was We're not, so it's, it's been a tough unranked. season, but you know yeah. what? We always got smoke for y'all, and you know this. Yeah, I know. You but know that, this. But that's over now. You guys are officially back to being that's our little brother. That's what y'all told us last year. I know. And that's but, what you told us the year before. But That's what you told us pretty much 
10 out of the last 12 and years. Say it this year. And we stay with a foot in y'all Says ass. Says an unranked team <laughs> talking to a ranked team. I, this is right. why I talk the most shit. Like, un- <laughs> un- we have nothing to, to lose. Rank, right? You have everything to what, lose. What does Drake say? Uh, quiet when a, a seven is talk when a 10 is in the room? <laughs> I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you see how he do? He did. You see, he he quoted Drake. You did me real grimy. <laughs> pulling out a Drake lyric. You did, you did me so grimy. Drake said it the best. This is going to make this ass whooping sweet. Yeah, it's Trust little, me. A little stick in here, Jamil. Look. It's a little stick. Turn your location on when we beat y'all Saturday. You, better, you turn better turn location. it on. I'm there. Come you better see turn me. it on. Pull up, Jamil. I'm going to pull be there all the way up. At the big house. Pull y'all up. Y'all see me here pull on, up. on Sway in the morning. <laughs> you coming up? You'll Monday be here morning. Monday. You'll be here. Pull up. Waiting here with pull Mike up. like what? Pull Jamil up. Hill. It's, Hill the it's not a game. It is not, not a game. I'm talking all this, but I tell you, woo, you did, 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 sometimes. <laughs> you know, hysterical. It's a wonderful rivalry. All jokes it aside, it's really a is. wonderful rivalry. Sounds violent. Both, <laughs> <laughs> both are great schools and both have much respect for each other. That's why the rivalry is so yeah, intense. I not that far. But yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, no, I'm, 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 I'm kidding. No, I'm trying to do radio. Yes, you're correct. You're right. You're right. My bad. Basically, like, I'm lying because I'm on the radio right now. That's what that, is that what you mean? Basically. So, so what, did your, what did your activism, what was it primarily informed? Was it because of the Oakland because roots? Because Oakland. <laughs> oh, As we bring it on back right. to Oakland. No, but in all seriousness, like my mother, she had such a love um, for the Black Panther Party in particular because she ate at their free breakfast program going uh-huh. up and, in Detroit. And so um, activism, being outspoken, was always... In the family lineage. But it's funny because when people call me an activist, I sort of don't know how to take that term mm-hmm. because the role of a journalist is not necessarily activism. But the more that I think about it, our work is the activism. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like the whole point of being a journalist is a phrase that I often heard in journalism school, which is we're supposed to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. It's like journalism is all about checking authority checking the people in power, making sure they're doing what they say they're doing, finding out where the money is. Like that's that's the part of journalism that I think um, is in many ways lost now. But mm-hmm. that was why I became a journalist is the accountability factor and also the opportunity to tell stories that other people aren't necessarily telling, especially about our people. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Jamil Hill is here, so that makes a lot of sense. Um, when you're, you know, a lot of us met you through the world of sports, but even reading yeah. this book, I, I see, I, I read a part of the book where you talked about, I want to go back and I might be mistaken to the year 2003, maybe. And you were covering a story on Michael Phelps. Oh, right. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. And then. It was 04, summer of 04. 04, 04 yep. right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm almost there. You, you, were, know, you were close. You got to be <laughs> impressed with this brain right here. I was only a year off. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um. And George Bush at that time was campaigning weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, right? And I remember Colin Powell, because I was a big fan of Colin Powell, was the kind of like the speaker (laughs) uh, for this campaign. He was the person that they put up front in it. And in the book, you talk about realizing that they lied about the weapons of mass destruction. Uh, at that time, you were covering sports. Were you covering politics at that time? I was not. Okay. And the 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 genesis of that story is the fact that me and my mother had gotten into an argument. Uh, I guess for further context, my mother is more conservative leaning, and we had gotten into a, a, a heated debate about George W. Bush and whether or not he was being truthful about these weapons of mass destruction. As we all know today, he was not. Okay? And so... That was, uh, but that w- politics were always of interest to me, and I know it's been fashionable in the last few years for people to pretend that sports and politics do not mix. They've always mixed. Sports has always been intertwined with culture, race, gender, politics, all of those hot button issues um, and topics in society. And often, as I told sports fans, you know, the moment you go to a stadium, you're that's political. That stadium was voted on by taxpayers, right? Mm. Um, and mm. a lot of the issues that we see in wider society are relevant there in sports. And in many cases, sports has been ahead of the rest of the society. I mean, Jackie Robinson integrated Major League Baseball in 1947. That was basically about 20 years before we got the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. And so 
integration was already starting to happen in sports before it kind of took place throughout the rest of the country. And it's important that we understand how the tentacles are related to one another because sports remains one of the few things in this country we still do together. I, I got two more questions. I'm going to let these I got 50 more questions, but I'm going <laughs> I'm to let these folks get in because they, they love you. Everybody in this room love you. Um, <clears throat> Colin Kaepernick, I think, um, has been more important to our culture than he's getting credit for. I feel like his journey, his sacrifice, all that's gone on in his life, not just his career, has been overlooked. Um, I think he's easier for us not to continue to have conversations about what the movement that he triggered helped to change and who are, who's benefiting from it now, even though it isn't it doesn't exonerate, in my opinion, the NFL and atrocities that they've committed over the decades when it comes to inequality. What would Jamil Hill write about Colin Kaepernick today? Well, it, the good thing is that I get an opportunity not to necessarily write, but to help Colin tell his story because I'm the executive producer on his documentary. Uh, he, he's going to have a 30 for 30 coming out on ESPN directed by Spike Lee. Ooh, I just got chills on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, so so good. Congratulations, right. Jamil. The good, so good. Thank you. So the good part is that um, I'm able to tell his story. And there's a lot, there's so much about Colin that people don't know. And just to give you guys an example of the type of person that he is and how he's ten toes down on everything. Uh, when he was making his decision about which outlet to go with in terms of wanting to tell his story, his documentary, he called me. Now, Colin and I were friendly, but I wouldn't go as far as to say we were friends. And we we realized um, our struggles were sort of intertwined in many respects because he was one of the first athletes that spoke out on my behalf when I was going through all the controversy mm -hmm. with Donald Trump. So before he made this decision, he called me and asked my opinion because ESPN was one of the outlets that he was considering and partnering to um, uh, have his documentary. And one, he did not owe me a phone call. But the main reason he called me was because, as he put it, he didn't want to undermine me by going to partner with ESPN because we had an awkward parting, and you all know why. Wow. And I just, I was really flabbergasted by that. Yeah. Had Colin never called me, I would have been, I would have, wouldn't have thought less of him. ESPN, to me, was the choice. And I told him that. I was like, listen, I know what you've read and you know what I've told you about my situation there, but they're the best vehicle to tell this story and in a powerful way. And then he said, okay, I, I really appreciate you being honest. And then he called me back 15 minutes later. He said, I tell you what will make me feel really good about mm. doing this with ESPN is if you come executive mm. produce. And I was like, Psh, you ain't got to threaten me with a good time. Hello. <laughs> yeah, buddy. <laughs> I'd love to do that. Wow. Collect one more check from ESPN. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, and and we've been, you know, filming and um, just hearing him tell, give people a just some indication or shed some light on what he's been experiencing since he um, decided to wage his protest in 2016 is is remarkable. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's just an outstanding person and. Oh. And beyond the activism and, and what he's done, just an outstanding guy. Yeah, so yeah. I'm I'm really happy for him. Yeah, I'm gonna let you hold that. Oh, look something. at that! Look at it! Look, look at Sway! Oh, oh my God! Wow. 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 <laughs> Jamil, you might want to hold that. You know put what? That you know what? Can we can we put the, we put gonna, that we gonna get this in the dock? Ty, is that in the dock? Uh, we're right gonna here. We're gonna get this in the dock. Okay. So wait, hold up. Take which camera? Right there. Which camera? This one. Okay. There y'all go. That's gonna be in the Sway. I know you know everybody. Well, well, you know. Let me tell you this day. This day we were at Viacom. And Colin held a closed room session uh, with 100 executives um, from Viacom, and he asked me to conduct, to moderate the discussion. Mm. You couldn't record it. You couldn't film it. You couldn't even take pictures till the end. And this is one of the pictures that Nessa took, who's <laughs> like my sister from the Bay. So yeah, did you see the picture of me and Colin? You showed me many oh, okay. times. All right. So I didn't know if you saw it. Shout out to Colin and All Nessa. Right. Nice yes, way. To both of them. Yeah. Well, not me. <laughs> All right. Well, Jamil Hill. <laughs> the memoir, Uphill. Wow. I'm listening to you speak, Jamil, and I'm thinking to myself, like, we kind of have these careers in the public eye, whether hip-hop, Sway and I started out, now doing radio and television and film, 
And you had to deal with something very public. A lot of times we can get to deal with some things privately, you know, especially with record labels and, and stuff like that. Did you, I, there's times I felt like this is too much for me. I just want to step away. With everything that happened to you in the public eye, did you feel like I'm done? Like this is too much? Like maybe even scared for your life, possibly? Well, the death threats were real. And wow. certainly one of the many ways getting in that um, back and forth with the president changed my life was that I had to move and navigate a different way mm. and that was not easy to deal with because I, I was even though people knew me from ESPN and I got recognized um, and even at times I would get racist hate mail and all that kind of stuff I never felt uneasy being in public once that happened it was a game changer where I didn't know you know that that's the thing what people don't realize when you're in the public eye they know you you don't know them right and so Suddenly, I'm going to a Monday night game and I have to have security. And other, you know, the FBI calling my agent and, and letting him know that there was a credible threat on my life. So wow. it's just all that stuff was, it wasn't overwhelming. It was more surreal. And I don't know if I had to kind of keep it, compartmentalize it that way just for my own sanity. But I never thought about um, about it making me shrink who I was. That was not an option. If anything, I would say uh, it made me more bold and determined because like, oh, this is what y'all got. Let me make you even matter. Uh -huh. if, if you I can make you I can make you mad. <laughs> and so I think by having that attitude, um, people uh, were really surprised. But as I write in the memoir um, and I would, you know, when, when people read it, that they'll understand why I constantly said this is that Donald Trump coming after me, if I had to rank that in the top 25 most, I don't know, alarming things or traumatic things, if you want to put it in that bucket to happen, it wouldn't even make the list. It really wouldn't. Mm. The way I grew up, what I've been able to overcome, those that's trauma. trauma. Okay, yeah. the president and an idiotic president at that, having something to say about me, the White House calling me to be, uh, uh, to be fired, like, that's nothing. You know, I saw my mother struggle through an addiction, struggle through being a sexual abuse survivor. My father struggled through an addiction. Those are things that stick more in my mind than that in terms of having to overcome and see some real adversity and struggle. And so, you know, as much as it may have been the thing that gave me a higher profile, it's not something that I ever considered would ever lessen me as a person. Mm -hmm. Jamil Hill. Mm -hmm. The memoir is uphill. I keep saying it because I want y'all to order this memoir. Yeah. It's um, out tomorrow, correct? Yes, it is out tomorrow. New York Times bestseller. I'm claiming it. You better claim yeah, that. I'm claiming it's it. It's a New York Times Say bestseller. It. It's already there. It's already, already there. there. Come on. Name it and claim it. Represent this <laughs> Oakland representative right here. Come on, citizens. Uh, okay, go ahead, Tracy. Not Oakland. <laughs> no, no, citizens, but in all honesty, this is a priority read. Like, you have had, are continuing to have such an extraordinary life, Jamil. One of the things I really appreciated from this book, especially you being a black woman, is sharing in detail your salaries. Oh, yeah. You yeah, don't I did. see that. <laughs> I did. Like from the start in 2006 when you had your column at ESPN, mm -hmm. and that was so refreshing because oftentimes it's like, wait, how much should I be getting paid for something? You know, in comparison to someone else. Obviously, we have so many conversations about um, the gender pay gap. Can you speak on how you, who taught you what your worth is? on a monetary level and how you determine what the dollar sign should be now, especially since your profile has risen? <laughs> well, uh, here's the thing is, and, and there's a there's a very intentional reason why I do share salary numbers. And when I have speaking engagements, I have a circle of friends who tend to do similar engagements. And I'm always telling them what I'm getting because the they count on the silence. They count on the lack of information. That's how they underpay you, right? Because... If you don't know what they could possibly give you, it works against you. And I remember um, a friend of mine, this was a, a few years ago, she had done a, a, a place I had done a speak engagement at. They were they wanted her to do the same one, and they offered her like maybe $15,000 less than me. Now, I would consider our profiles to be similar, mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, you can probably even argue hers was a little higher. And they offered me more and and this was before the the Trump stuff had happened, so it wasn't a result of that. 
And, you know, I put her up on game. I was like, well, this is what they spent. And so if they give you a dime less than that, then they're really trying to get over. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because what they offer you is not all they have. It's just what they're willing to give you. And so I think women especially, black women on top of that, especially knowing where we are in the gender pay gap, which is basically toward the bottom, um, we condition ourselves into thinking that everybody, uh, even though we tend to outperform, but we have this mentality sometimes that we're charity, right? That, oh, they're giving me an opportunity. I'm very careful not to use that word. They didn't give me shit, (laughs) okay? I got here for a reason and with a lot of experience and work and sweat equity I put into this. Mm -hmm. And so knowing what I bring to the table, um, I my team is very aggressive in what they seek for me. And yeah, there are times where with people, you know, there's a difference if Sway called me versus if, you know, IBM called me. You know what I'm saying? I'll do it for you Thank for you, you Sway. I appreciate it, but like not a, for Mike. <laughs> <laughs> you better charge oh, Mike. Mike ain't on the, oh yeah, Mike, Mike getting double. <laughs> I was like, maze and blue, huh? All right. <laughs> Triple. But no, I mean it, it, there is there is something that is women, it's a attitude that we have to really adopt. Um, is understanding our worth, understanding our value. And so in the book, yeah, that's why I talk about my first contract. Everybody assumed I was making all this money because just because they see my name in ESPN, that first deal was terrible. It was mm-hmm. a, it was what they call a two and two, a two year deal with a two year option, and it was a, a company option. I had so outperformed that deal, they were getting a hell of discount. They brought me in at at one fifty, and this is I was a con, uh, independent contractor, so they didn't pay my benefits. Right. So like. When it's tax time, it's tax time. And y'all know what that is, Mm -hmm. right? So it's like you're paying for your own health care, your own 401k, all of that stuff. And my salary went up 10000 every year. So over the course of four years, I got maybe a $30,000 pay raise. So that is not sufficient given the fact that I was on TV probably, you know, half the year and writing columns on top of that. And I looked at other people who were in my same category and they making twice as much as I am. And so it really wasn't until my third ESPN contract that I really felt like I got more than um, or I got what I was worth or was starting to, I should say, because even initially, I think my first um, couple years on his and hers with my buddy Michael Smith, Mike was making more than me and we were doing the same job. Mm-hmm. Oh, right? that's interesting. And so, yeah. Did but it, but did it's y'all com- discuss your salaries? Oh, and this is why, again, men need to be allies in this gender pay gap as well. Mike put me up on game and was like, hey, sis, I just want to let you know, this is what I'm getting. Mm. And I was like, okay, all right. And shout out to yeah, Mike. Sh- yes. Shout out to him for that. And so, and we had the same representation too. And the good part is that the next deal, the Sports Center deal, um, we were a both paid the the same money, mm-hmm. and um, uh, I got a signing bonus that let's just say was a financial apology. <laughs> well, you go to Mill Hill. Wait, wait, come on. <laughs> I just want to. Good. Uh, I want to lean into. This is not my question, but I want to lean into that about uh, how individuals and corporations entity they know that our weakness is that we don't speak up and we don't communicate with each other about what our salaries are, right? I just went through that recently. A friend of mine caught me up with the same kind of dynamic and I told her, because that was the max they was offering her, Mm. I told her, I was like, that's my minimum, right? Mm. And so she was like, what? Right, and then, but to your point, we have to open up these type of conversations in order to empower each other to then go back to the table to request more and demand, like, no, I have data that mm-hmm. suggests you do, you are paying this. And you have to, you have to have a selfless spirit about it in the sense that there are some people who don't share that information because they don't want to be judged for what they're getting, mm-hmm. whether it be positively or negatively. And also, a lot of people have the mentality of wanting to be the only one in the room making money. Mm. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, if I tell Mm. any of my girls or any of my people, period, hey, I'm making this, and they wind up getting twice as much because of what I told them, God bless you. I am happy. Right? Because at the end of the day, the next time I go back in, I could be like, but you you paid Mike this. Mm -hmm. So if you paid him this, then I deserve this. So Mm -hmm. it's like we have to not have that. Uh, mentality of wanting to keep everything to ourselves like I don't want to be the only black woman in the room the only Mm -hmm. black person in the room I don't want to be the only black woman making X amount of money I want us all to be able to make 
that kind of money and, for that matter, have that kind of access mm -hmm. to uh, the C-suites. But I want to know, Jamil, when it comes to equating money, I'm curious about activism. Does that equate? And you said you had the pulse on the athletes in the sports world. We saw what happened with Colin Kaepernick, LeBron James. We see what's happening with Serena Williams and Naomi Osaka. They speak out, right? Do you feel athletes now are getting more comfortable in, in speaking out for things that they stand for? Or do you find that they are are retreating back into their bubble and not wanting to say anything. You know, it is it's kind of a bit of a mixed bag. I do think it's been very helpful that somebody like LeBron James in his position has been so outspoken because mm -hmm. it's a different tone when the best athlete in the world does it or the best athlete uh, or the best player in the NBA when they do it because then that gives a lot of cover for everybody else. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why I think Colin did not have the support that he should have was because the other players didn't stand up. I mean, mm. some of them did, not everybody, but not enough of them. He didn't need the whole league, but he needed more people in prominent positions in the NFL to have his back. And when they didn't, the owners got the message they could treat him and the other players any kind of way. And they didn't understand the bigger fight. Like, even if you disagree with the method of protest or the setting and thought that, no, this is not a place to be doing this at football games. Even if you disagree with that, understand it was about the precedent being set for what they could do to the next player. That means the next player, they could take their career away over this. Do you really want the owners to have that kind of power? The answer is you don't. But because they've done that, it sent a very specific message to NFL players that if you do this, We'll, we'll excuse a lot of things. We'll excuse you hitting a woman. We'll excuse you... Um, drugs. Drugs. We'll excuse you being involved in other criminal activity. Yeah. What we can't excuse is that because that creates a different power dynamic that they don't want to upset. It wasn't necessarily about... Um, I mean, the protest was one part, but the other part the owners didn't want is Colin Kaepernick's influence in the locker room uh -huh. because then you start asking questions about, mm, why are we not all getting guaranteed contracts? Uh, what's up with health care? What's up with how y'all treat us when it comes to concussions and other medical issues? They start asking questions, and they did not want that to become a, a prevalent. They didn't want the, the critical thinking aspect to become prevalent in the league. So when you ask me if players are retreating, I think it depends on the league and the player. Uh, I did. We did, certainly saw a wave of athletes start to speak out, and I can't really even say that the female athletes that we saw speak out, see, that's there every day. They they speak out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, because they have to fight for their respect all the time. So they're used to being vocal. So I wasn't surprised that the WNBA took the steps that they did, especially when it came to the last Georgia Senate race. Mm -hmm. Or people re have to remember, before Colin took a knee, the Minnesota Lynx, they spoke out about Philando Castillo. Mm, yeah, And... The Minnesota, the Minneapolis Police Department was so upset, they walked off their post during their game because a lot of off-duty officers worked security for their games, and they all walked off the post and didn't want to work with them anymore. See, people forget that happened. Yeah. So women have been accustomed to this fight, but I, I just think a lot of athletes still see more reward, more risk than reward. And so um, I love that the players, it really did start a different level of consciousness I just wonder if it's been sustainable. Jamil Hill, this is why we love you. Jamil Hill, yes. Uphill, a memoir. Thank you, my family. Yes. My Oakland. Yee! Oh, yee! God. Go ahead and say it, Jamil. Go ahead and say it. Go ahead, Michigan. Jamil. Just one yee! Go what ahead. up, though, Jamil? Yee! Oh, she's there! Oh. Listen, I just want to tell all of you that I love and appreciate what you all do, what you bring to my mornings, be especially, I mean, you guys are such a routine for me, so I could, I'm a citizen, like, you a citizen. A, straight up. You a citizen? Was, you I'm, ain't even asking. No. Oh, oh, oh I, what? I, I, you a citizen. There was no per permission. I am a citizen, you sir. You are a citizen. Yes, yes indeed. I'm, 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 I'm knee deep in citizen high. I, love I just that. want y'all to know. Thank you. Thank you. So thank y'all for um, allowing me to come on here and, and, and talk about the memoir. And, you know, thank you to all the citizens out there because I love your support and I love the energy y'all bring to the show. And so <laughs> this is you. wonderful. So thank Jamil you. Jamil Hill, thank we you, are Jamil. family. <laughs> we are family. Hey, hey, we love hey. having you as a citizen yes. and all the work you're doing. And this is amazing. Get the book. 
Yeah. Uphill buy memoir. It, y'all. Get the book. And if you can't buy it from a black bookstore. There For you real. go. <laughs> right, speaking of black, we got Babyface coming up next. He's standing outside Jamil. He's standing outside yeah. Jamil. Yo, that part. Babyface. I'm about to rush Babyface. Do your I'll be, thing. I'll be back, y'all.